today with somebody. Um, you know, I was raised by my grandmother, and so I, I was never exposed to going through drive throughs I was never exposed to really going out to restaurants. It was a, considered a special occasion if mm-hmm. you went out to eat. Right. Other than that, it was, you know, fresh produce. You, you have your meats. Um, you know, it was lots of leftovers, but it was home cooking. It was not pulling out of a freezer. Not that there's anything wrong. There are some, you know, fresh uh, vegetables you can get that are frozen that are good, but that's not typically what people are doing. They're buying prepackaged frozen meals, pulling them out of the freezer, heating them up, and calling that cooking. And I think we now look at convenience today versus looking at really what our bodies are intended to eat and where we're supposed to be. I don't know how you feel on that. No, I I totally agree. They did this study, and it was published in a really reputable journal called Pediatrics. Mm -hmm. And they looked at children with ADD, and they basically put them on a healthy diet with no preservatives, no chemicals. How did they do? 50% of those kids, ADD, went away. Wow. So it's it's, And if you were to look at that study. And this is in pediatrics. I mean, this doesn't get publicity. Absolutely. But, you know, again, this is, should be something where you go to your doctor's office mm-hmm. and they say, you know, 50% of kids on a very healthy, clean diet are having no symptoms. Their attention and yeah. focus and their impulsivity and their hyperactivity. That should be the first therapy yes. that is recommended. Well, it shouldn't almost be a therapy. I think it should be a lifestyle. Exactly. And I think that our kids are here to really teach us to change our lifestyle, but I don't think a lot of us are listening still because, again, it's that convenience. But I'm thinking as a school teacher, if you were the teacher in the classroom, the very first thing I'd be pushing the parents for is change that breakfast, you know, at least change the breakfast. And I tell that to a lot of parents, you know, and if you guys are watching, changing one meal at a time, I think it's it's um, it's doable. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean that you can't have certain treats from time to time, but when we look at a typical American diet in the morning for breakfast, it's either a frozen waffle, you know, um, syrups all over it, or they have cinnamon toast, or the cereals that they eat are so sugary, and we wonder why they're bouncing off the wall. I mean, I had seen somebody drink, you know, a soda pop on their way to school, and I'm thinking... I cannot even imagine, I can't even fathom my grandmother giving me that for breakfast. I mean, we had oatmeal, maybe some orange juice, maybe a piece of toast, but never did we have a soda pop on the way to school. And so it's fascinating to me why we wonder, why it's such this huge mystery of why our kids are hyperactive, you know, why the world is kind of changing. You know how they say we are what we eat. We truly are what we eat, right? Yeah. In our (laughs) practice, we talk a lot about these, what we call environmental um, changes that people need to make Mm -hmm. in their home environment and in their school environment, um, in their bathrooms, you know, in terms of what they expose themselves to. The cleaning products, the hair products. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, I'd ask somebody, um, you know, I I know with my son, we changed all the cleaning products pretty early on when I learned about it. And I had asked one of the moms, because she says, well, I can't do that. And I said, well, why? She says, because I'm so used to buying the same things I've always bought. And I go, well, it's interesting. Why do you think you buy those particular cleaners? And she's like, I don't know, and I guess because I've always have. Well, if you really think about it, if she would really dig deeper, she probably bought them because her mom bought them. Mm-hmm. Her mom probably bought them because her grandma bought them. And so it wasn't as though they're attached to that particular product because it's the best. It's just they're attached to the idea of seeing something comfortable. And again, it's changing one thing at a time. So whether it be your laundry detergent or it be the thing you clean the mm-hmm. toilet with or um, even your hair products, I mean, it's not that difficult because you're going to buy it anyways. Yeah. It's just getting used to, I guess, buying a different product and educating yourself on what is, I guess, a cleaner product. Right. I mean, these chemicals that are in these products are called persistent organic pollutants. Wow. And they're called persistent because they say persistent in our body. Our body doesn't really have the detox mechanisms to handle them. God didn't design us to detox these chemicals because he didn't design the chemicals. Yeah, we designed them. Yes. Oh, my goodness. And so they stay persistent in our body and in our fat. And in a small child, there's not a lot of fat. And the nervous system really makes most, you know, contributes to most of the fat in the body. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, the the myelin sheath that Mm -hmm. covers the nerves. And then the brain is 70% fat. And so we need that to be able to function properly. Right. And so these chemicals get stored in the fat of our kids. And they are called endocrine disruptors because they disrupt the hormone system but they do a lot more damage they're finding out than just the hormone system. They affect behavior, they affect attention, they affect um, 
um, free radicals and oxidative stress. So, there, mm. I mean, it's not so simple as we used to think that we're fine yeah. living in this uh, world surrounded with artificial things and chemicals. We're really not fine. And an autistic kid, we, we almost consider the autistic kids canaries in those coal mines mm -hmm. because they used to throw, they used to send the canaries down to see if they would get affected. Mm -hmm. And our kids are affected already. So and they're not coming out of the coal mine as canaries. That's the, that's the sad part. Yes. That's and the sad part. And so we need to create some of these precautionary, um, you know, changes in our lives. Mm -hmm. We can't do the things that we used to do and think we'll be okay. And if we want our kids to get better, we need to be strong and make these changes. And we need to advocate for our, our children Absolutely. in their schools. Mm -hmm. I remember when they used to have pop machines in the schools. Yeah, at the edge of still? Not in our schools. No? Okay. No, children are not allowed to buy pop at school. There's no candy. There's no pop. There's no chips. Oh, that was saying that, that's good because I remember growing up, um, we didn't have it in elementary school. But we did have it in junior high, and then we had it in high school, so that must have been about the time they probably introduced that um, in my uh, school area. I'm from California, and I remember thinking, wow, I can't believe I'm drinking a soda pop at school because that was so unheard of. I mean, juice box you might get, or milk you might get, and but never would you ever get soda pop. And so it's fascinating to me the world that we live in today. And it's interesting because the kids today think that's normal. Mm -hmm. They really do. They think it's so common. Um, I was talking to somebody, and I can't remember, they said y they couldn't believe my son was nine and a half and has never tasted soda pop. And wow. they said, how is that possible? And I said, <laughs> and I, said well, I don't think there's another child on this <laughs> In the, <laughs> in the U.S. like well, your son. And I think it's because um, it wasn't because I was this organic, healthy person when he was younger. I mean, I tried my best. Um, but it went two and a half when he was diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, I was making all of his own food. You know, I was one of those moms that I wanted to jump in and home make the baby food and, you know, do everything I could. And I never understood why somebody would give a two and a half year old soda pop. So I didn't do it. And then I, we got the diagnosis and I learned about diets. I'm like, there's no way. No. So he has never in his life tasted soda pop, which wow. I'm sure one day he will behind my back, but he has not yet. <laughs> we just take the um, seltzer water mm -hmm. and we add juice to it. And I've that's how my kids drink soda pop. And it's a healthy version. Yeah. Absolutely. It's kind of. <laughs> well, it's healthier than sort of pop. Yeah. Now, yeah. we're about out of time, and I wanted to make sure that, um, you know, you have so much valuable information. I swear I could sit here all day because I know, I know who, if you guys were ever have the chance to listen to Dr. Usman speak or get any of her presentations, I highly recommend it because I've seen so many. And you don't have just one presentation. You have, like, hundreds of presentations. I get bored of hearing myself say the same thing over and over But again, we don't. So we, I, like we, to try, <laughs> I like to talk about different things. We love hearing everything you have to say because <laughs> so you're so sweet. brilliant in the work that you do. And you. as a parent, I'm so appreciative that you're out there on the front lines, you know, trying to make it a better world for us in this community and for not just autism but other labels that people get diagnosed with. Um, do you have any words of encouragement to the families out there that are just starting this journey? I think for the families that are just starting, the main thing is educate yourself. Talk to other parents like you because I think that's so valuable. I mean, talking to your doctors may or may not help you along this journey right now. I think a lot of the doctors are still not educated, mm -hmm. and we're trying to change that a, a little bit Absolutely, right? with, your, yeah. with your show and everything. Um, talk to other parents. Educate yourself. And do what feels right to you, what resonates with you. I think pa parents don't always listen to their intuition. They're, they're too busy listening to what other people say and what mm -hmm. other people think. I have so many moms and dads said, you know, I really didn't want to do that, and I did it. Mm. Or, you know, I thought of this for a long time, but I just didn't do it because so-and-so said it wasn't a good idea. So, so trust really your instincts. Tr trust your instincts. Listen to yourself. And you have to be your, your child's biggest supporter, biggest fan, biggest advocate. Because right now, we don't have a lot of people advocating for our children, so we have to be doing it for them. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Usman. You're, Usman. You're always a pleasure to talk with. Thank you. <laughs> and if you guys want to um, learn more about Dr. Usman's work, please go to her website at www.truehealthmedical.com. Again, that's truehealth.com 
medical.com. And if you missed the presentation here today that she gave, oh gosh, please check out uh, nationalautismassociation.org. Thanks again to all of you guys for allowing us to bring hope into your home. Until next time, bye. Thank you for joining us for Autism Approved with Kristen Selby Gonzalez. Please join us next week for another episode brought to you by Enza Medica.